Have I come to the right place? I think I have. I'm glad that you've all come to the right place as well, so that's a good, a good start. Um, it's nice to be here, um, and thank you for the introduction. I'll say just a little bit about myself, first of all, when, uh, when I start the thing going. Um, yeah, what do we know? Good question. What do we know? Uh, so, first of all, um, I've had a long-term interest in this area. I've been working in the field for quite a long time, and I've been in a rather lucky position because it's been my job, basically, to be doing research, evaluation, and, and uh, professional development stuff to do with teaching and learning with media for many, many years. It hasn't been a sideline. It's been the main thing that I do. So, you know, that's rather unusual for, for, for many people to be in that sort of position. Um, and I've worked at both strategic uh, sort of university committees, doling out money or being gatekeepers for what can be done and what can't be done, but also at tactical levels working with um, modules and courses as they're being produced and giving advice as to how things might be used or might not be used. So a whole range of different stuff there. I try to be working in a way that uh, is, is to do with inquiry and evidence. So I'm trying to find out what's happening, why it's happening, what could be done about it if it's not working the way we want it to work, and so on and so forth. And looking at the, the sort of issues that involved rather than necessarily being swept along by the latest fashion or trend. And I was, I was just saying just a moment ago, I described myself as being a sceptical enthusiast. Um, so I can, I can swap my, my spots depending on who it is I'm talking to. So if I go into a, a group of people who are very, very sort of, should I say, unenthusiastic, I can sort of try and G them up and give them all sorts of examples of wonderful things they can do. If I go into a room of, uh, and the people are the other way around, they're, they're people who are G whiz, everything's going to be absolutely wonderful, we just do this, 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 add this, and, and everything's going to be wonderful, I can be just the opposite and, and play the opposite side. So I'm an enthusiast of this sort of area. Uh, I say that as a sort of preface to some of the other things I'm going to say later on, because I'm actually interested in what actually happens rather than what we would like to see happen. I would like to sort of narrow that gap between the two, if at all possible. And it seemed obvious to say, but actually, use of learning technology is much more complex than most people imagine. <clears throat> I, was, I was thinking as I was watching the end of the last uh, presentation, uh, there's this interesting history of, of waves of technological determinism. It goes back at least the last 60, 70 years. Some would take it back even to the 1920s or before that. There's, there was a wonderful thing about... Um, learning using uh, audio on Canadian trains, which was quite good in the 1920s. Um, but there was a whole load of stuff, particularly sort of since the end of the Second World War, there was all sorts of things which were going to save the world and its educational problems. First of all, it was going to be television, and that was going to solve everything. You just beam in all these TV programs to the rest of the world. All the education problems are going to be solved. Didn't seem to work. Uh, and then a bit later on, it was all about, oh, well, yes, we've got this new computer-based learning stuff, and there's all these lovely programs that you can do on your little computer, and that's all going to save the world, and everything's going to change there. So, mm, yeah, so that didn't really matter. And then, of course, the Internet came along, and everybody said, oh, that's going to make a big difference. We've got the Internet. And then the next wave was, you know, it's going to be the, the World Wide Web is going to do everything, because you can do everything with that. And then it's Web 2, you know, and now, you know, the latest sort of big fashions. Oh, MOOCs are going to change everything, and... Absolutely everything's going to be totally different. And everything just plods along more or less the same all that time. So there's wave after wave after wave after wave. <clears throat> so I've tried to put together a few bits and pieces that have sort of occurred to me over the last few years and, uh, and see how some of these things go on. I've punctuated this with a few quotes from Aldous Huxley. So this is the first of several. So I hope that's all right. Most human beings have an almost infinite capacity for taking things for granted. Uh, quite a good one there. Um, and again, when I've looked at various uh, aspects of what I've been doing, this sort of comes out all the time. So some of the conceptions that people have, particularly when they're working in higher education, are, are quite interesting ones in terms of everybody's got strong feelings about what it is, is but they automatically seem to assume that everybody else has the same one. So most of my working life, I've been working with teams of people designing modules and courses rather than individuals. And so when you have a team put together, one of the first things that happens is everybody has wonderful agreement about what it is they want to do. And then when they actually get down to doing it, things start to sort of fragment and fall, not fall apart, but sort of go separate ways because suddenly these people realise that when person A says something about what I'm going to do in my teaching or what I expect my students to do for learning, they assume that everybody understands what they mean. Person B and person C don't necessarily have that same 
feeling. And yet it's usually left very much as an implicit assumption. So, so much is taken for granted in university education. So, you know, what's teaching about, what's learning about, and so on and so forth. You know, just assume that everybody knows what it is. So, questions like, what's the essence of teaching in higher education? What are we doing? This was touched upon in the first um, presentation there. What's the nature of student learning? What's that all about? What is, and this is here we're getting onto the technology bit of it, what is technology enhanced learning? It's the big sort of phrase that's been around for the last few years. What does that actually mean? And how does it change the student experience? And after all of those, what's the main driver of study activity? What do learners actually do? What makes them do things that they, they do? And this is my opportunity for, to let you have a little bit of a, a think and a little bit of a chat rather than me talking all the time. So a bit of interaction here, or interaction between you and your people who are with you, um, close by. Can you just spend a few minutes thinking about those issues, thinking about what you think about them? You obviously can't get very far with it, but just a few first sort of thoughts. And then turn to you know, a neighbour or two where you are sitting, if you've got that, uh, a neighbour or two that you can talk, turn to and talk with, and just find out what they think about it. And, and, and are there similarities between what you're thinking about, or are there differences? I know it's a big question. I'm only going to give you a few minutes, but at least I want to give you the flavour of starting to talk to other people about these things rather than just assuming all the time. So there you are. You've got five minutes at least. It depends on how well it goes. I'll stop you after a while. <laughs> Over to you. <coughs> Oh, well. 
Okay, can I draw a halt to everybody? I've opened the can of worms and now everybody's at it now. Well, I'm really glad that you took that time to sort of talk to one another. That, that's really great. And, and if we were in a different context and a different situation, we'd be doing it for much longer. And then I'd be taking feedback from you and finding out what the sorts of things you would... Uh, unfortunately, we can't do that sort of thing because there are too many other bits and pieces. But it's quite useful. And I want you to sort of bear in mind some of the, the things you've been talking about. I mean, my main message is, is actually it's quite useful to start trying to make explicit some of those things which are very much sort of taken for granted most of the time. And, uh, and one of the best ways of making things explicit is actually to talk to one another, which is, you know, a, a good thing. So uh, just a few things here. Um, again, I'm not going to try and give answers to any of these sort of questions in, in the strictest sort of sense, but just some, throw up some interesting bits and pieces which would be useful for you to think about, hopefully. So what about teaching in universities? Well, there's all sorts of, you know, different views about what this actually is about. You know, you've got things as being about, the, you know, varies between the teaching as transmission of knowledge or as promoting the conceptual development of learners. That's sort of one sort of view of, of what's gone on. It's been well researched. There's about teaching as telling, teaching as organising, teaching as making learning possible. Again, differences that people have, maybe at different times in their careers or at different situations in terms of what it is they're trying to do. And then learning is just as much the same. You know, there's lots of different views about what learning is about. So, you know, the whole thing about Perry and his intellectual development, you know, about from learning viewed as memorising and reproducing sort of knowledge and facts through to learning for personal meaning, all that sort of stuff about developing as a person rather than just actually taking things on. And that links back to some of the stuff that was being said in the first session this morning about, you know, what's learning about. It's interesting where some studies have been done about... Uh, there was a great study I, I read some years ago which was called The Residues of Learning, where somebody actually went back and did sort of interviews with people some years after they graduated. And by that time, most of the people that were interviewed um, didn't use most of the stuff, the facts and the knowledge they'd learned. What they'd got was, you know, how to go about doing things, how to improve their confidence, how to work with other people. All those sorts of things were the stuff that stuck with them rather than the actual knowledge that they're giving. And, uh, and so that's, that's a, you know, just one little interesting point there. Learning as quantitative or qualitative change. Now, a lot of people will, will think about learning as being qualitative change, but when it actually comes to assessment, what do they do? They give them things which actually you, you can put numbers against and you can tick boxes and you can say quantitatively what's happened here. OK, that's one sort of thing. Uh, learning as acquisition or learning as pa participation. The whole thing about are you doing it individually or are you doing it in combination with other people? Uh, if you are participating with other people, that's a, that's a very different sort of way of that than just sort of sitting at home. It's very important for us when we were at the Open University because there were a number of students who thought that all they had to do was sit at home and just read the books, and that was all it was all about. That was all just about acquisition. So how do we get them to participate more in what was going on? Learning is involving solitary or social activities. This is another sort of facet of the same thing, but it, it, it's very interesting in terms of what, what that involves. So there are a whole range of sort of different views about what learning is about. But again, my important thing is not necessarily to say one of these is right and one of them is wrong or anything of that sort, but actually to have people discussing and talking about these things and, and talking about them explicitly. So another little quote from Aldous Huxley. Technological progress has merely provided us with more efficient means of going backwards. Uh, there was a couple of interesting uh, research papers I found. Um, one, one by uh, Mayodusa and, and his associates, and one by Harrington and Harrington, called One Step Forward for Technology, Two Steps Backward for Pedagogy. Uh, and in the rush to sort of try and get latest things going, people forget about what's actually going on. And, uh, you know, a lot can be said about the... the the way that the current craze for MOOCs is being manifested in many places, I won't say in all places, but in many places, it's being manifested simply just as um, you know, a transmission type sort of process. A bit like what I'm doing now, really. <coughs> as far as my interest in, in technology is concerned, I mean, one of the interesting things about, so what do we mean by enhancement? Now, enhancement, when I sort of come across the word, suggests that it's got something to do with making something better or being improved in some way but it could also be just taken as being more of it it doesn't necessarily mean improved or better so although the fact that this this uh, expression is used a great deal it's, it's generally used without a very very clear expression or a shared meaning of what's going on very few uh, explicit statements uh, and what's it all about what is being enhanced is it the teaching is it learning 
Is it operational arrangements? In other words, is it making it easier for universities to do things and administer things rather than actually the te changing the teaching and learning? How is it understood by teachers, students, policymakers? And are they, have they got similar views as to what it means? Because that's another aspect. You know, one person's view about what an enhancement is could be very different from somebody else's. OK. So this, this raises all sorts of issues when uh, you're doing any sort of research or evaluation in terms of technology-enhanced learning or technology projects, because how do you demonstrate enhancement? How easily is it to, to demonstrate what you're well, If you're not absolutely clear what it is you're trying to enhance in the first place, it's actually quite difficult to know how you're going to demonstrate that it's been improved. Much depends on the type of enhancement being sought. So a lot of stuff people say, oh, well, it's actually to make things you know, more flexible for students so that they can do things when they want to. They can get things anytime, anywhere. They can do this, that, and the other. That's fine. You know, that's good. I've got, I've got no problem with that. But that doesn't necessarily mean that the learning that goes on is any enhanced in any way. It's just that it's happening in a slightly different way. It's very contested as to what this actually means. What does enhancement mean? And uh, when I was doing a bit of a, a literature review, which I'll come back to in a moment, it was very difficult sometimes to actually try and find out what it was that people were trying to do. They kept talking about their enhancing learning, but you had to really read between the lines to find out what on earth it was that they were actually supposed to be doing. So, on to another quote from Aldous Huxley. This is a variation on a theme. There's various versions of this, but this is Aldous Huxley's one. That men do not learn, men and women, we should say these days. I mean, Aldous Huxley was quite a few years ago, so we got away with it. Um, that, that they do not learn much from history is the most important of all lessons of history. Um, I want to tell you a little bit about a study that I was involved in a couple of years ago, uh, and, and which was about looking at projects and what it's all about. And so I was, I was trying to take a sort of a bit of a, a, a meta level view of, of what it was all about. Uh, it came about because of a, a project from the Higher Education Authority. Uh, they wanted a, a synthesis project to be done. Uh, what evidence was there from all these projects that were being funded all around the country to get technology in, into universities uh, to improve teaching and learning? What evidence were these projects all generating? Their sort of, when we went to the initial meetings, the sort of background to this was the assumption that there was lots of research and evaluation going on on these projects, um, and the problem was that people weren't taking account of the evidence that was being coming out of all these projects before they then tried something different or somebody else picked it up. So there wasn't a lot of sharing of evidence. So all we had to do was to go through all these reports, synthesise all the stuff together and say, here's all the evidence to, that, that says this works, that doesn't work, this works, that doesn't work, so on and so forth. That was, seems to be the sort of premise. Um, after a little while, it became clear that that was totally impossible to do. Because uh, it was like talking about, well, how do you add up oranges, pears, curbstones, umbrellas, you know, orangutans, all the rest of it. It was a very, very difficult problem. And uh, what we'd done is, is what's outlined here, we, we'd gone looking in the literature for specific things where they were talking not just about the promise of what might happen, but where there had been actual studies done in universities. Uh, English language, it wasn't necessarily in England, it was English language, uh, and um, what had been done, what the findings were, and what the outcomes were, with real groups of students as opposed to experiments or whatever it was. And uh, as I say, we had enormous problems, so we then had to dig deeper into it. And uh, so we, we looked at a great deal of uh, these things, and by examining all their sort of what it was they were trying to do, what it was they were trying to uh, get out of the thing and, and how they're going about it, we came up with three main categories of different types of um, technology-enhanced learning projects. One of them, the first sort of uh, set of interventions, was about replicating existing teaching practices. So this was, instead of giving a lecture in a room full of people, you, uh, you made a video of your lecture and you transferred that to other people. That was one example of, of things, and, and there are all sorts of variations upon that. Okay. Um, and there were an enormous number of the um, things we looked at, the case studies and the literature things, were in that sort of category, the replication. The second one was about supplementing existing teaching, and that was actually sort of saying, uh, yeah, there, there are some limitations with what we can do, so we'll add an extra bit of something to, to, to try and make it better. 
Uh, so we're, it was a bit clearer then of sometimes what enhanced meant. We're going to give an additional feature to this, which is going to make people, the students, do, do things slightly differently. Uh, and and uh, it's going to be in addition to what went on before. And those first two categories were by far the largest of the two categories that, there were, that we found case studies in. The third one was what you might call the sort of transforming the learning experience. And this is the sort of disruptive bit that comes into the, the thing here. This is actually trying to do things differently. And uh, this was a, a relatively small group of, of studies that came into this uh, categorization. And uh, the interesting thing about these was the fact that it, it, it wasn't just a matter of using technology. It was the fact that these people had ideas. They wanted to change what they were doing anyway. And they were using technology as tools for enabling them to do that. So it wasn't, the technology wasn't seen as the driver of this thing, it was the enabler of them to do what they wanted to do. So three very different sort of ways uh, of doing it, uh, of, of categorising these experiences. And as I say, the first two, there were far, far more uh, things in there than in the third one. But in doing this, it was actually quite a hard process to get to that point because we had to read and reread and, and reanalyze these things because, you, as I say, usually you had to go you know, between the lines about what was actually they were talking about. And you know, there was much difference in terms of what was considered the evidence that was useful for this thing. So, for instance, particularly when you're doing just replication type studies, people were saying, oh, well, I'll do the test scores from, from one group of students, and I'll do the test scores from the second group of students who've got it by the other way, and I'll compare them. You know, very quantitative view of what, what learning was all about, very, very um, sort of simple model of how, how things could be going on. If you looked at the other end of the, the thing, the, the sort of transformational ones, people were saying, oh, well, you, you can only look at this in all sorts of different ways, and it may not actually show up in the assessment processes because the assessment's already sort of fairly written in stone. Uh, it may be uh, we'll have to find it through other means and we'll have to sort of do all sorts of things, interviews and, and, and all sorts of things to get that out. So, you know, it would actually be quite useful. A, a lot of what I'm saying today is all about sort of trying to make explicit uh, what is very often taken for granted or just left implicit. So what is meant by enhanced learning in higher education, that might actually, might actually be quite a help there. OK, I found this picture and I liked it. It was sort of stuck in a box. And it was the feeling I got when I was reading a whole load of these reports and, and so on and so forth, that, that a lot of the people who were trying to do various things uh, were stuck in, in their sort of way of thinking about things. They could only think about replicating things. They, so they wanted to use technology, but they had to do things other ways. So again, and I come back to, to MOOCs as being an example of this. You know, how do you use technology? You use it to sort of put things on the internet and, and get things out to everybody else rather than just to a room full of people. You don't actually think about, is that the best way to have somebody standing at the front of the room just talking at the camera uh, or just talking to a group of people? Uh, you, know, you could want to do something different. Nice picture. I've acknowledged it there. So the other thing that came out from looking at these things was, was a sort of difference in view that that, that, that people were sort of taking when they were doing things. And this is all about, you know, so who's responsible? What's making the change? What is it that's happening? And I've put down here sort of technology's agent. So sometimes the agent for change was seen to be the technology itself. Okay, so they were saying, well, if I take on such and such a thing, uh, then such a thing, you know, there will be certain consequences will follow from that. So if teachers use and or get their students to use a particular technology, this will in and of itself improve student learning. This is a very sort of reductionist, sort of technologically deterministic view of, of how it goes on there, with technology seen as the agent of change. If you see the teacher as the agent of change, you're the person that, that makes the, uh, the, the decisions about what goes on. Uh, what are you trying to do for your students? What do you want them to learn? And what do you want them to get out of it? And in that sort of frame of mind, taking the agent as the teacher rather than the technology, it's all about designing things so that the students can get the outcomes and using the technology to enable those designs to be uh, achieved. And again, this sounds fairly obvious, but when you look at vast numbers of reports and case studies and things as I did, when I say vast numbers, I mean vast numbers, uh, far more of them were in the first of those sort of mindsets than in the second mindset. Most of the ones which were about transformative type stuff were in this mindset. Most of the other stuff was in the other one. So what's change with technology? What is that all about? So again, if you apply this sort of who's the agent involved here, you, know, you, you vary between technology will change the way that I teach and how my students learn. 
So I can use technology to change the ways in which I teach and my students learn. So the agent is different there. It's the technology or the person. And technology-enhanced learning is about changing the means by which university students are taught, which is a rather sort of deterministic sort of view, or it's about changing teaching and learning in universities. And this is the disruptive bit coming into it here. How are we actually trying to do things? Are we trying to do things differently? And I get amazed when I look at a whole range of these things which talk about these wonderful um, uh, innovations that they're doing with all sorts of technologies. And, and they're still stuck in that box of thinking in the old way about this is a very sort of simple way of doing it. It's all about just transmitting information in more effective and efficient ways. So over the years, I've come to think of, of you know, what are the main influences on, of, of technology use in universities? Most people usually start at this bottom end here, the technology. So they talk about its characteristics. Oh, this wonderful new bit of software will do this. This wonderful new piece of equipment will do that. You know, we've got to have students having tablets or this, that, and the other. Um, and they start with all the stuff about the technology. And, and usually, they don't go a great, great deal further than that. And when you get reports from people who've done uh, evaluations and research, which are based on that sort of view, it sort of assumes that all you have to do is read their report, and you can then apply this everywhere else. Dead simple. However, context is important. What's the context in which it's going to be used? So obviously, I have most of my background in terms of distance learning, uh, and most of you have a background in terms of non-distance learning. So that automatically makes a difference in terms of what people are expecting to do and how they're expecting to do it. But there are all sorts of other ones in terms of what type of learning it is. Is it you're talking about professional learning? Are you talking about very academic, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. And the third one is actually the design for learning. I come back to this thing about design. I mean, because I've been in this field for a long, long time, I remember the move uh, in the Open University from where we had television programs to where we had video programs. And initially, video programs were television programs on a piece of tape. Um, and everybody said, oh, this is great. It's great because people can, don't have to stay up and watch them. They can sort of go and use them wherever they want to, where, however they want to. But they were still television programs on tape. It took a while for people to suddenly think, actually, if people have got that much control over what they're doing, we can actually do things which are very, very different. So we don't have to be stuck by the old conventions of TV program formats and all the stuff that goes with that, telling a story in 28 minutes or whatever it is. You know, we can do great long things. We can do lots of short little extracts. We can do all sorts of things. We can get people to present people with all sorts of information for them to then analyze and, and, and do. And so there's no explicit teaching necessarily in the video itself. They can do all sorts of things with it. Uh, and it took quite a while to actually get around to designing things differently for a different medium. And a lot of what I've seen from the reports I've read and the case studies, people are trying to do the, the old thing with new technology rather than trying to do new things with new technology. And of course, there's those three aspects, and of course, they all interact in terms of how they all sort of fit together. But as I say, most of the things you look at often ignore the other things. Clarifying aims and goals is, is one of the sort of top level aspects of it. Uh, surprising how often that is not made explicit. So, what is it you're trying to do? You know, is it just about the use of technology? Is it about the environment in which it happens? Are we talking about changing teaching practices? Or are we talking about student learning? Do you want to come in and take a seat? Yes, sir. Please do, while you're leaning, the, leaning there. So again, making explicit these things and actually talking with colleagues and, and, and uh, others about this is actually quite useful. So differing views about teaching with technology. So I've had this, you know, I, I referred to this before, but if you, if you focus on the technology, and how it might be used, uh, it's far more likely just to lead to replication or supplementation of existing teaching. It's a very teacher-centered sort of way to do it. If the focus is on the learners and the learning, you're thinking about what do I want my learners to be able to do? Where do I want them to get to? How do I want them to get those sorts of things? And therefore, how can I, you know, what, what technologies will enable me to get to that sort of area? So again, I mean, using an example from, from my my own sort of background, uh, if we wanted students in the Open University to discuss things with one another, you couldn't get them all in a room together and say, discuss it. You had to set up 
situation in which they did it. You also then had to set up a situation in which they saw what the benefits were of getting together to discuss it and to show that there was some reward to be got from getting together to discuss it. Because if you just say, oh, here's an idea, go and discuss it, uh, it's not going to get anywhere. So it's actually talking about how do you actually support the sort of type of learning you want to get out of this. Quick change of gear. Now, eagle-eyed amongst you here will be interested in there's a few characters. Is this the one that points? No, it's not working. I'm interested in this young lady here and the one behind her. <laughs> These two. But there aren't many. Most of them are sitting there with their laptops, which is interesting. And they're all Apple's notice. So I think this is an Apple-sponsored um, college. But what are they doing? I mean, it's quite a common sight these days to go into a lecture hall and see the place full of people with their laptops. One over here, one over here. I mean. What are the people doing? You know, are they actually um, making notes of what's going on in the lecture? Are they reading the pre-existing notes that you've sent them in advance for the lecture? Are they on Twitter? Are they on Facebook to their friends back home, talking about whatever it is? There? Are they watching a video? One's at the back, probably watching something completely different. Nothing to do with the lecture whatsoever. You've got no idea what's going on there. But anyway. I, I like this picture, but it, it's really all to do with you know, the, the big thing we've had again uh, recently about you know, there's a net generation and things have to be done differently for the net generation. And it's quite interesting. Uh, a lot of assertions were made without any research whatsoever. They were just what people thought was the case. Um, subsequently, there's been quite a lot of research undertaken. So some of the evidence from the research is that there's a, a confusion of two major issues. One is to do with technical skills and familiarity. So, yes, it's true that younger people, compared with sort of my age and others, like many of us in the room, uh, have much better access and familiarity with using various different computer applications and so on and so forth, doing it all the time. However, when you get down to things like the intellectual skills that are involved, digital literacy and its requirements for education, there's actually very little evidence whatsoever that actually just using things to, to go on Facebook and, and communicate with various people does anything as far as educational purposes are concerned. So, you know, the fact that people are always on email, always, always sending Twitter messages and all the rest of it doesn't mean to say that they can actually take part in a good online discussion uh, and a proper debate and whether they can actually find information. You know, everybody these days, you know, goes on their, their favourite search engine to find this, that and the other. But what do they do when they found it? And how do they evaluate what they found? How do they make sense of what they've got. And it's very much the case that universities uh, you know, really, really need to um, develop dig digital literacy um, skills in learners. And I would say not just universities, but schools as well, in terms of what goes on. Because that is really sort of very unhelpful, this whole thing about digital natives and so on and so forth, because they, it, it doesn't get to the point that we're actually interested in. So another bit of uh, finding from research, student study behaviour is not driven by technology. That may not surprise you. What is it driven by? <laughs> yeah, something that you could have uh, has an impact on fear, but what, what, what's that? Yep, assessment usually is what it's all about. You do all sorts of studies on things and you say, why did you do this and why did you not do that? And they do things because they're going to be assessed on them, and they don't do things when they're not going to be assessed on them. Simple as that, really. Um, they make more use of tools and resources and consider them helpful when it's linked in with the assessment and the pedagogy of what goes on. It sounds very obvious when you do it this way. In fact, when I was talking with sort of module teams, course teams, and things like that, I said, uh, do you want the short version of my introductory talk, or do you want the full version? And they said, well, let's start with the short one. So I said, OK, two sentences. You know, students will only do what they're going to be assessed on, so don't waste your time doing the other things, because uh, it's not worth it. Now we go into the longer version, and I'll give you the background to that. <laughs> but, but basically, that's, that's it in sort of two sentences. Um, it's the primary driver of student study behaviour. One of the questions I had at the beginning, what's the primary driver? It's, it's what they're going to be assessed on is the most important thing. Now, I'm not one of those people that says, you know, all students are, are, are purely instrumental and they only do those things because that's the only thing they're interested in. It's usually most people have got, haven't got time to do all of the things that they'd like to do 
and so they have to be selective, and that's the thing that guides their selection. If they've got time to catch up on all the other things, they might do them. But usually, people will start with what they're going to be assessed on, and then fill in the gaps afterwards if they find time to do it. But it's not just a matter of what gets studied, it's also a matter of how it gets studied. So how they think they're going to be assessed can actually influence the, what they pay attention to. So if they think they're going to have a multiple choice you know, factual answer quiz, they'll spend their time concentrating on the facts and the figures and all the rest of it and, and tick the right boxes there. If they think they're going to be assessed on, you know, well, what's, how do you actually understand this? How do we make sense of this? And, and, and something that requires a lot more sort of thought and consideration in, rather than just the, the regurgitation of facts, then they will study it in a different way. And again, this is all well researched. There's, there's a lot of evidence on this. How am I doing? Oh, all right. So, what follows for teaching? Um, again, a couple of minutes. I've thrown a whole load of stuff at you about teaching, learning, technology, enhanced learning, about the role of assessment, making things explicit rather than implicit. What's that going to mean to you over the next few days, hours, weeks, months? Again, I want you to spend just a couple of minutes thinking about that and talking with your neighbour again. You're going to have less time this time than before because I've almost run out of time. But, <laughs> but it would be useful for you to think, OK, I've thrown a whole load of stuff at you. Does it make any sense? Does it chime with you? Or, does it sort of, or do you not think it makes a great deal of sense? What's it going to have, what impact is it going to have on you as, a, as an individual and what you do? So over to you again for a few minutes. And when I wave my arms like this, it means we want everybody to stop and come back into the room again. Thank you.
call you to a halt again for a moment. I feel dreadful doing that because everybody's having such a good time talking with one another. But, you know, there'll be a break after this. You can carry on your conversation. Well, I hope you do carry on these conversations, some of you, afterwards. Um, again, I'm not going to go into, you know, exactly what it was you were talking about. If we had time and, and energy, we would do that. Um, so it's, it's down to you, your departmental head, and your promotions committee, what you actually take from this. Um, but one of the things I just wanted to, to finish off with, just a, a few extra little ideas. Uh, one was when um, universities started taking on their um, you know, VLEs or, or management learning systems or whatever they like to call them, there seemed to be in most institutions this sort of notion that it was just a matter of, oh, well, we acquire this technology stuff and then we just teach the staff how to use it and, and it's just a matter of letting them know what they can do with it and let them get on with it. Uh, that, I won't say that's necessarily the case now, but it certainly was in the in the early years of, of what was going on. And of course, there's there's a whole range of different issues and influences upon what actually, you know, why teachers do things. You know, what are their attitudes to the option of innovations? You know, there's the whole um, thing about early adopters and, and all that sort of stuff. And so people, are m some people are much more likely to do things than others. There are differences in teachers' conceptions about you know what they think teaching and learning is all about. And, um, you know, that was one of the things I touched on earlier on in the thing where I got you talking in the first stage there. There's all sorts of things to do with faculty and, and departmental ethos in terms of what goes on. Uh, you know, the, well, we don't do things like that around here is, is a sort of common expression you get. Even if people sort of try and do certain things, oh, no, that's not the way we do it. And then, of course, there's all the stuff about competing demands of research and administration as well as all the sort of teaching stuff that are going on. It means that people, unlike me in my sort of luxurious position I had where I could spend a lot of time thinking about this, most people aren't in that position, and I'm, I'm fully aware that that's the case. But it's just one of the other influences that there are on what people do. So it's not just a matter of saying, well, here it is, just learn how to use it, and that's it, fine, that's dead easy. It's actually much more complicated than that. Again, looking at what goes on in some of the sort of professional development activities, very often what you uh, find is, is that there's a sort of technology focus to what's done. It's a matter of you know, how to use these tools. So you know, universities will run little things which sort of say, come along to this and find out how to use a blog, find out how to use a wiki. You know, how to, but not why. You know, why usually doesn't get uh, um, brought up as a topic for discussion. And that's actually far more important than the how. You know, why should you want to use this? Why should it be a useful thing to be doing? So it's, it's often, in that sort of case, it's, it's just seen as a means of delivery rather than anything else. It's, it's just you know, this sort of continuation. If you have a learning focus, it's rather different to what goes on in the sort of um, professional development. It's all about why technology might be useful and how you're going to get students and learners to get to where you want them to get to. And that involves not just saying, this is how we use the equipment, but it's actually getting people to think about what it is they're doing it for, what views they've got about um, teaching, what views they've got about learning, what it is they're trying to be the outcomes there. And it's a very, very different perspective again then. So just to finish with, I wanted to go through just a few of these things. Um, some of the stuff I was doing in, in the most recent sort of months of my uh, employment involved doing um, some professional development stuff with module and course teams and getting them to look at and talk about in a team what it was that they were trying to do with technology. And we got them to think about things in terms of six main uh, categories of, of ways in which technology could be used. Now, I'm not saying these are the only six, but these are the six which sort of covered most of the stuff. And having got them to do this and think about it for how they map their stuff onto the, the, these categories, look at... So 
is one of them got far too much in it than the other ones, or far too little of you know, whatever it is? So presentational, that's the thing that everybody knows about. You know, read, listen, watch, observe, do all those sorts of things. Um, that's, that's fairly straightforward stuff, the giving of information. And uh, you know, if you find that 90% of the stuff is in that category, there's something wrong, basically. Uh, interactive or adaptive, when people are actually doing things with exercises and, and simulations and so forth. And some of them could be, some of them can be um, fairly simple. Some of them can actually be really quite complex and, and take a lot of time. Um, some wonderful things that got created to do with the Galapagos Islands in, the, in our science faculty, where people had to find all sorts of information about different islands and try and account for all the differences that there were between them. And it was a group activity. Ooh, lovely stuff. Finding and handling information. This is all the information literacy stuff about, you know, well, how do you evaluate the information that you found? Or what do you actually do with this? So on and so forth. So, you know, it's all very important, increasingly important, because actually getting the information these days is dead simple. Actually knowing what to do with it once you've got it is far more complicated. And, and so this is, is a very important area for, for everybody to be working on. Experiential, particularly where people are sort of doing things where there's, it's like a professional qualification, so nursing or law or, or um, education or what have you. Where they've got the, actually relating these things to people's own experience. It could, I'm not saying it doesn't apply to other things as well, but that's you know, one of the most important areas where this comes in. How do you relate the academic to the, the real world, as it were, and how do you get those things going backwards and forwards? Obviously, the communicative, how do you get teachers talking with their students? How do you get students talking with their students? Uh, and then the final bit is what I've called productive, uh, where learners record, create, assemble, store, retrieve using a portfolio or just any sort of thing for assessment or assignment. And by going through and trying to assign what people are thinking they're, they're doing in their, their course or their module to those sort of six categories, when you find that you've got 90% in the front one and nothing in most of the others, you, you think to yourself, no, actually there ought to be a different ratio, different balance. I'm not saying that there's any one right balance, but usually 90% and all the rest is 10% is not a good balance. So I'm going to leave at that point. So just to reiterate my last points here, far too often technology is used for just presentation and replication. And you know, the, the, the stuff to do with MOOCs and webcasts of lectures and PowerPoint presentations and the rest of it, you know, they, as, as the last speaker said, they have their place. But when you, that's seen as being the main thing that goes on, that clearly isn't a good idea. Where are these people developing the skills for learning, and particularly where are they developing the skills for learning throughout life when they're no longer in an institution? If all they're doing is sitting, receiving stuff. So, I told you I was an enthusiast. So, you go away. Hopefully you're going to have something useful to carry away with you from this session. Some things to think about. No answers necessarily, but lots of things to think about. So I hope you've enjoyed it and you found something useful there. And that's it. OK, thank you, um, Adrian. That was really useful. We've had a lot of uh, activity on the Twitter feed. Um, and obviously, um, one of the questions was, you know, technology is no good if it doesn't change the way that we teach as well as the way that we learn. And I think that's a really interesting question. Uh, Christabel uh, is in a project where they gave a lot of computers, well, every child was to have a mm. computer, but the teachers weren't trained in the use before the children got their yeah. computers. So I wondered what you thought about that. Yes, very important, very important. Um, one hopes that... Um, but using the technology will enable people to do things differently. And I, when I say people, I don't just mean students, I mean the teachers as well. Um, it, it's a matter of getting outside uh, you know, um, what goes on. As I was saying a bit earlier on, there, there was an example of, you know, if we want um, students in a distance teaching university to, to work together on projects, we have to design a thing which allows them to get together. Uh, it doesn't just happen. Um, and what is amusing, I, I find, when, when we do this, is we, we give them a tool for doing it, and most of them don't use it. They use other things instead. They'll, they'll get together and they'll use their, their own favourite sort of bit of software or something like that to, to communicate with one another, particularly if they think it's going to be seen by other people because they want to keep things to themselves mostly, and so we have to try and get them out of that idea. But there was this wonderful um, task that was set in, in the course I was, I was uh, chair of some, some years back, uh, which was about getting the... So this was a master's level module, and it was 
so it was aimed at teachers in mainly in universities and, and colleges and so on and so forth, and it was trying to improve their use of, of knowledge of, of using various technologies and all that. And we wanted them to get, in those days, sort of podcasting, do-it-yourself podcasting was quite a new thing. So on this particular year I'm thinking about, there was this activity which was to uh, get each of the students to make their own uh, five to ten minute podcast on a topic relevant to the course, and then to upload it onto the onto the uh, VLE system, and then so that the first part of the activity was, was get yourself in a position where you can record it and make your thing, upload it, and then download at least two others, and then you do a sort of a critical appraisal of the other people, other students' stuff. So you're seeing what other people are doing, and other people are commenting in that way, and that was quite useful. So then uh, to download these things and then sent, upload their comments on these other ones at the end of it, and. Uh, one of my favourite ones of the whole lot, most of them were fairly sort of routine, mundane, ordinary sort of type things where they were just going through you know, the advantages, disadvantages of doing these things. And one person was going through about uh, using um, online sort of forums for communicating with other, between students and doing various bits and pieces. And it was, it, the first half of this podcast was fairly sort of straightforward, talking about sort of advantages, disadvantages of doing it. And then the second half she said, uh, now I'm going to describe to you my tutor group. Now, this is a distance teaching, a distance learning student. She'd never met any of these people. Uh, They're spread all around the world. This was a globally based course, so we had people in all sorts of different continents. And in the second half of her sort of audio podcast, she described the other students. And she said, uh, you know, well, I'll sign so, you know, he's tall and handsome, you know, because I can tell that from the so sort of comments he makes. <laughs> And, you know, it was full of all these sort of things where how she'd, she'd drawn up a, a mental picture of all these people purely by reading what they'd, they'd done. And um, it seemed rather strange at the time, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought this is really good because actually you're sort of saying it's not just a means of, of throwing bits of text backwards and forwards. It's actually a way of integrating, uh, integrating a group of people together and actually thinking about uh, those individuals rather than just lines of text on a screen. And so we then try to develop that a bit further and actually make it into you know, much more of a sort of thing where you're thinking about what are the other people like? What are they doing? How are they, how, why are they contributing in the way that they're doing? So you know, it's, it's much more than just this sort of technological way of swapping things and, and, and allowing communication in that way. It's actually making people think in slightly different ways. If you can... Uh, design the right sort of activities to get there. Okay, um, any questions? First of all, thank you for that. I thought it was brilliant and really helpful. Thank you. I'd like to trade you a quote. Mm. My quote's from 1934, it's T.S. Eliot. Right. It's, where is the life we've lost in living? Where's the wisdom we've lost in knowledge? And where is the knowledge we've lost in information? Mm. And I think if we relate that to what you were talking about, Digital literacy is actually something we should be teaching in primary schools. Mm, yep. Hopefully at some time we'll get around to it. Yep. But digital synthesis is what we may have to be teaching in future. And what I'm getting at there is across disciplinary boundaries because yep. most of the challenges that we'll face as an information age is how we synthesise information across the traditional boundaries of our subjects. Um, I'm doing some work for all Academy of Engineering at the moment. And we're looking at the use of data analytics in various industries, mm. in energy and transport. And the crying thing that's missing in those industries are people who have a combination of mathematical skills, statistical skills, computer science skills, yeah. skills of that particular industry. Mm -hmm. It's the synthesis of those that's actually holding us back. So not only do we need to change what we're teaching as well as how we're teaching. Yes. I can't disagree with anything you say. I can't provide you with any more <laughs> enlightenment or, or, or whatever. But, but yes, and, and this idea about having... Um, I don't like the term generic skills, but skills which are much more wide-ranging than just the thing that you're working on, uh, I think is exceedingly important. And, and very often in, in undergraduate courses, they say, oh, oh, we'll leave that till the last year to do that. Whereas actually, it'd be much better off if they started you know, in a small way, very early on, and gradually build it up and build it up and build it up, rather than saying that's something we do in the last year. Um, yes, I mean, I'm very much in favor of what you say in terms of doing that. Precisely how it's done is a, is a problem. <laughs> Thanks, Asia. I don't disagree with anything you've said, but I'm struggling but. to identify the, um, the uh, educational development that you describe because I consult in a very wide range of universities. Mm. I've probably been in more than 30 in the last six right. years. 
And my experience is that um, you know, educational development is absolutely focused on embedding these mm. skills into the curriculum. Yeah. We've had six years of the Higher Education Academy trying to do that yeah. through, its, uh, through its various subject groups. Um, the, the, the kind of ways of thinking about learning activity that you, you showed, showed us, which, which are very similar to the ones that Diana Lorillard talked about mm. in her 2001 yeah. book, Rethinking University Teaching, yeah. which I, you might want to acknowledge as an inspiration. They have been embedded Diana's into... Diana's an inspiration. Uh, absolutely. They've been embedded for, for, you know, certainly for the last um, 18 years mm. into, into most of what people who work yeah. with this technology in universities do. So while I don't disagree with anything mm. you've said, I'm just wondering where this characterisation that, 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 that educational development focuses on the technology is coming from. Um, things have changed dramatically over the last few years. I'll, I'll grant that. However, I still think there are... There's, there's lots of evidence of, of pockets of these things going on, N not so much in the, you know, the, the, with all the, the courses particularly done through the HEA to do with sort of new people and getting their qualifications, enormous amount of that's going on there. It's what happens with the people who aren't going through that process, who are the ones who've been in post for quite some time. And, and so, yes, I mean, that's a pool which is getting smaller and smaller when old duffers like me get, disappear. Um, but... Uh, that's the area where I think it still can be identified, not, not for the new people coming in and the, or the recently appointed people, but for the older ones. I think there's still quite a lot of that going on. Um, yeah. And I used to work with Diana, so I did the... Hello there. Thanks very much for your talk. The question I have is, um, how do we convince those who are skeptical mm. or perhaps there's such a thing as informed skepticism, but then there's the opposite, which uninformed, I would think is, yeah. Yeah. yeah, or even prejudice. How do we overcome that? Mm. Um, what I would always think is, is the best idea is something which is, you know, leading by example, showing something that actually is useful. And I don't just mean, um, you know, pointing at something and say, oh, you know, Fred Bloggs in, in MIT did this, that and the other. Actually, if you're able to sort of think about what it could mean to you in your particular institution, in your department, in your course, your module, and, and think about some learning activity that could involve these sorts of uh, technologies and then show how that might work to, to colleagues, that, that would have you know, a much better Im uh, impact than just to sort of, sort of say, oh, well, this is what they've done at X university or this is what they've done at Y university. Uh, actually, to sort of show, narrow it down into your particular context. I think it would be much more useful. Not that easy necessarily, but that's what I would suggest. Aim towards it. Okay, I think this will have to be our last question. Oh, I'm not going to talk to this man. <laughs> so you said something fascinating, which is people try to do old things with new technologies rather than doing new things with new technology. Mm. Uh, but since it's a disruptive event, I would say to what extent we can do new things with old technology. Do you think that is possible? Yes. I do. Um, I'm trying to think of some examples. Uh, um, again, going back to, to, to some stuff I did in recent times in the Open University, it was quite interesting because there was a very, very popular course, module, whatever you like to call it, um, that was designed to be an online-only course, or very largely online. I won't say only, 80% plus online stuff. And it was very popular, it was very good, so on and so forth. Uh, and then a problem arose because it was one of the courses that the university uh, was popular on the list of courses that were taken in prisons by people who were doing long-term prison sentences. And one of the things that they don't allow in uh, prisons for the students is internet access to do things on computers. They can do things on standalone computers. They can't do things using the internet. So it, this threw this team into a great disarray. So what do we do here? We've got this thing, we've designed it specifically to be an online sort of module, an online course, and all the things are, are making use of the technology to allow us to do those sorts of things. How do we do this when we can't do it? And they had to do a lot of scratching of heads and all that, and they had to come sort of a bit of regression down to, that's what we're trying to do. Let's find other ways of doing that which don't involve going on the internet and talking to other people in that way. It was not quite as good as they would have hoped, but it actually made them think about it, and they actually started, well, what can we do when we've got to go back a step or two? And, and they found some of it could be done, some of it couldn't be done, and they do, did what they could. So that's just one example. Okay, thank you very much, Adrian. Okay. Thank you all very much indeed. Thank you.